The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Today, we're going to talk about wallets and SPV. And if you don't know what SPV stands for, that will be defined as well, so don't worry. First, you get your software. That's something of a problem, but like, how do you know you got the right Bitcoin software? There can be issues there. But anyway, there are multiple implementations that should be consensus compatible. I often use uh, BTCD, which is a version written in Go, but sort of the, the main implementation is written in C++. Um, so you get the software, and then you somehow connect to peers in the network. So there's, there's all these sort of asterisks, which mean it's not completely decentralized. You have to find where to get it. You have to find who to connect to. And once you do that, you get all the headers, which are 80 bytes each. You verify all the work. And then you start getting the blocks, looking through the transactions. You replay the history of the last nine years of the coin. And then you arrive at a UTXO set, an unspent, unspent transaction output set. Um, and it should be the same as everyone else got, right? Everyone else has had the same headers, the same work, the same transactions. They'll get the same set of who's, you know, which, which coins are encumbered by which keys, as you do. Um, and the idea is it would be very expensive to you know, have different UTXO sets because you'd have to do all that work. OK, so that's the full node. And that's you know, how a node works. But what about dealing with actual money? So far, we've just looked at, OK, here's how to get your node running. Here's how to observe the network and come to the same conclusions as everyone else. But you probably want to actually do something with this, right? You want to pay people or get paid. Those are sort of the two fundamental functions that this tries to address. So the software that manages this feature is called a wallet. And it's not necessarily the same software as what's connecting to the network, downloading, and verifying. Um, in the case of Bitcoin Core, it is, although many of the programmers of Bitcoin Core wish that it weren't. And there's sort of a long-term goal of, it'd be really great if we could sort of pull these two things apart into maybe separate binaries, separate programs, something. Um, but they're really intertwined, and it's kind of ugly. Um, but there are other things that, that are separate. OK, so wallet software. Functionality seems simple, right? You send and receive money. Simple. Um, of course, you need to resend money before you can send it, so let's start with that. <laughs> um, OK, so we talked about receive. Uh, we, we did not talk about receive addresses. We did talk about the script and how it's uh, generally used pay to pub key hash, where you have you know, you, you put the hash of your pub key in your output script, and then in your redeem script, in your input, you put the pub key itself, which is then checked against the hash, and then the signature is verified. Most likely, you've, if you've looked at Bitcoin at all, you've seen these types of addresses. They usually start with one. They're a bunch of characters long, weird mix of lowercase, uppercase, let, numbers, and letters. There's a standard for converting a 20-byte pub key hash into this address. Um, so the idea is, since almost everything is using the same pub key hash script, you can forget about the um, op codes like op dupe, op hash 160, op equal verify, because they're, they're always the same. And so it's the standard, like, OK, we're just taking that 20 byte hash, and now let's convert it to something hopefully somewhat human readable and writable um, so that people can write it down, say it over the phone. Uh, this is the one Satoshi made. It's got 58 characters, and then the last well, the last four bytes, which ends up being like five or six of the letters, is sort of a checksum, where you take the hash of the first however many letters, and then that's supposed to be like equal to the next ones. Uh, so hopefully, if you type something wrong, it doesn't change the hash, and then you send it to the wrong place, and then no one has a matching key for that. Um, there's a newer standard for this, where all the, lowers, all the letters are lowercase. Um, that's introduced, actually, today in Bitcoin Core. Uh, version 0 0.16 came out. And so there's a new standard called BEC32. They, they did some research, and they found it was actually much faster to transmit over the phone via voice, because you didn't have to say whether things were uppercase or lowercase, which ended up being very annoying for people. Because uh, <laughs> you know, one big F, eight little F, one two big E, four, it's, it's annoying. Anyway, but the idea is this is just, um, this is just an encoding of the 20-byte pub key hash. So when you type this into a program, it reads this, converts it into a 20-byte hash, builds the output script. OK, so the outputs are all the same. Um, so this is sort of like a UI thing. 
it, the addresses don't really exist at the, low, at the protocol level. Uh, okay, any questions about addresses? Fairly, okay. We're not gonna, they're, they're, you know, UI and like usability is super important, but not to the focus yet of what we're doing. Okay, the idea in a lot of cases is you want to receive money and know that you received it or somehow interact with people over computers. And you can put a bunch of addresses on a server, but keep your private keys offline. Because if you keep both your public key and your private key on the same computer, that's kind of an attractive target for someone to break into your system. Because they say, oh, like, you know, this, this guy's running Bitcoin and he's accepting payments. There might be a bunch of money in this computer. If I can get into it, I can take all the money. Um, so one issue that people ran up against pretty early is, well, let's say I generate 10, uh, 10 keys, you know, 10 private keys, 10 public keys, 10 addresses, uh, put them on the server, and then I run out. And I can reuse addresses, but that can hurt privacy because people can then see that the same, you know, the same people are using these keys. So is there any clever way we can generate pub keys without the private key? Is there any, given all the fun, key stuff we've talked about. Can anyone think of any clever ways to do that? Okay, well, pretty straightforward. This is, this is called BIP32, Bitcoin Improvement Protocol 32, uh, Proposal 32. It's actually, this is a super simplified version, but this is the basic idea of what they do. They do it much more involved and complicated. But basically, you've got your public key P, big P, and some kind of randomized data, randomizer data R. And you know, or, oops, sorry, your private key is just little p. Uh, block that. Um, so the idea is you want to send to an address, you want to generate a new address. Well, it's just your public key plus the hash of r concatenated with one times g. And if you wanted to make this two, three, you can make this any number you want. And then your private key is just going to be your, that same public key plus the hash of r. Right? So you give someone some extra data which they can throw into a hash function. Um, use this sort of as a every you know a, a known uh, private key, and you add it to your private key. So no one you know no one just knowing this data can spend from it. Um, that's really nice because then the server can generate arbitrary numbers. Does this make sense? Okay. What's the difference between big A and A? Oh yeah. So, so in the last ones, uh, big A is a public key. It's a point on the curve. Okay. Um, little A is a private key. I screwed that up. <laughs> uh, that should not have a G, right? So G is the generator for the group. Uh, G is sort of how you convert from a private key to a public key. You just multiply by G, which is just an arbitrary point. Yes? So your private key doesn't change? Um, so in this case, there's sort of two private keys. There's your, your standard private key that you actually just randomly created, this number P, multiply it by G to get big P. Um, but your private key for any particular address does change. Right? You're adding the hash of r comma 1 or r comma 2, r comma 3. Uh, this yes. is assuming the size of r is relatively small compared to p, because don't you have to keep track of the nonce? Uh, r, r should be like 32 bytes or something. You know, you don't want track anyone. Of it every time you create a new transaction. Right? Um, you sort of don't. What you can do is you can have the server, you, you, you have your server, and you say, hey, I'm going to accept payments for cookies or shoes or whatever I'm selling. And then you give the, pay, the server your public key P and this randomizer R. And you just say to the server, go wild. Uh, make whatever number you want here. It has to be, this number should be fairly small. Let's say less than a billion. And then when you want to find how much you've gotten paid, well, you can generate a billion private keys here. Uh, some reasonable number that the computer can actually do it. Um, and you can generate, you know, you can just increment this, generate a ton of addresses, and look for them on the blockchain. Yeah, so that makes sense at all. BIP32 is actually quite a bit more involved and complicated. This is the basic idea, but they make sort of trees of it. And you can say, oh, well, like, you know, we can make, instead of just one level, we can make like a whole tree of these things and like have different accounts and like make a really full featured system in case people want to use this kind of thing. Yeah, so you can put public key and this random data on the server. The server can make addresses as needed uh, really quickly. And what's nice is observers can't link these addresses, right? If you're just looking at the blockchain, you won't see 
the difference between like a sub one and a sub two, if this number is one or two, because it's going through this hash function, you ever see that. To an observer, it looks like all completely different addresses. And if someone hacks into the server and finds this P point and this R randomizer, well, that will allow them to link everything. Now they can see, oh, we can, we can also generate all these addresses. We can see that it's all the same person. Uh, but that doesn't let them steal any of the funds. So compromising the server with this, well, you lose the privacy, but you don't lose your money. Uh, so that's a pretty good trade-off. Okay, other questions about the preview? Cool. So that's one of the features for like wallets. Got to do this. Okay, so the basic procedure, you're going to request a payment. And you're going to say, hey, if you want this jacket, uh, send one coin to address F8F12E. And it's sort of important to note that Bitcoin doesn't solve the problem of people paying money and not getting what they paid for, right? That's out of the scope of this. Although there's a lot of people who's like, you know, it should, but you know, it doesn't do fraud protection. It's like, hey, I gave you the coin, you didn't give me the jacket. Well, Bitcoin worked fine. Bitcoin made the coin move. That's, that's Bitcoin's job. The fact that FedEx never delivered your jacket, well, that's sort of FedEx or the retailer or all, all sorts of things like that. Um, so that's, you know, I don't want to say it's not a problem. It certainly is, uh, but it is sort of seen as out of scope. It's like, you know, this is a money system. This is money. The dollar, you know, your dollar bills don't ensure that you're getting what you paid for. Um, that said, there's all sorts of things that do this kind of thing and do try to ensure delivery versus payment. Um, atomic swaps, HDLCs that we'll talk about later, zero knowledge, uh, contingent proofs, like all, all these different things do sort of work on top of Bitcoin to try to help these kinds of things. In practice, though, if you're actually buying like a physical jacket that someone's going to deliver to you, there's not really a good cryptographic proof of jacket delivery. Um, so it's some reputation is involved, right? Then from the merchant's perspective, so I sell jackets. I want to know if someone paid me, right? I have something on the website, put in your address. OK, now pay this address. So you add all your pubkey hashes to a big list in your software. You say, OK, here's all the addresses I've created. Um, they're all you know, these 20 byte pubkey hashes. I put them in a map or some kind of array or some database, whatever. Um, and then from then on, every transaction I see on the network, I also look at the output scripts. So before, when I was verifying uh, the blockchain, I actually never had to look at the output scripts until they got spent, right? Um, so when I was downloading transactions, I would look at their signatures and look at old, you know, the old UTXOs in the UTXO set and match them up and verify. Um, but where the money got sent in these new transactions, I didn't really care, right? It could have been sending it to zero. It could have been sending it to some weird address that probably was wrong. I, there was no, there, and I believe to this day, there's still no output validation that happens in Bitcoin as a consensus rule because it's not important, right? Where are you sending the money? Well, wherever you want. And are you able to spend it? We'll deal with that later, right? If you want to destroy your money, fine. I'm not going to look at the output. There's no invalid output, right? There can be an invalid input, which there can be an output which you can never actually use, um, but you're free to send to it. So that's sort of one of the you know, rules in Bitcoin. However, in this new, in, you know, when we're actually looking at our own money with the wallet, we do look at the output scripts, mainly to say, hey, is this ours? Um, are we getting paid with this transaction? So you look at every output script, and if you see one that matches, hey, we got paid, right? So you see a transaction, one of the outputs, hey, look, that 20 bytes, that's, that's me, cool. That's one of the addresses that I have. Um, let me keep track of this. This is now money that's in my wallet. Um, so you keep track of the received payments. You save them to disk in a similar way to your addresses. You use some kind of database or map or something, um, something efficient. And then you don't need to save too much information, right? You need to save the, the out point, right? The TX ID of the transaction, the index. Uh, you probably want to save how much your amount and which key it was. So you, the actual 20 byte pub key hash. Uh, you could look through all your keys, but it might be nice. Oh, that's my 17th key that I've saved in my database or something. Um, you may also want to save the height information, when it got confirmed. Uh, so we're not going to talk too much about unconfirmed versus confirmed today, but this can be an issue if you see a transaction on the network that's not yet in a block and it pays you. And you're like, hey, I got money. 
but it's not confirmed yet. So have I really gotten money? Um, I am able to use that output to spend somewhere else, but now I've got two sort of chained transactions, neither of which is confirmed. And now the second one can only be confirmed if the first one is. Um, so that can get ugly kind of quick. Um, for simplicity's sake, let's just say that you wait until it's in a block before your wallet recognizes it. Um, most wallets do not do that, but most wallets maybe should. Um, there can be a lot of weird attacks where you say like, oh, I got money. And then since it never really was confirmed at all, it's pretty easy for someone to double spend. Right? The whole point of the Bitcoin system was you can't double spend because it's got all this proof of work on top of it. It's in a block. Um, but if we show in the UI, hey, you got a payment that has not yet become, you know, gone into a block, well, there's no assurance that it won't be double spent yet because it's not in the blockchain. Um, but most wallets will show that. And usually they'll make it in like red or put a little exclamation point or something to try to indicate like, hey, this is unconfirmed. Um, but that doesn't always get across to people. Uh, so it may be safer to just not show it at all until it's in a block. OK, so yeah, you, you sort of amass all these UTXOs, right? You're running your, you're running your node. You've got all these addresses you've given out to people. And then every transaction that comes in, you look, hey, do any of these pay me? And sometimes you'll find one that does, which is great. And then you save that to your disk. And great, now next, I want to spend them. OK, any, any questions about the sort of getting money procedure? Yes? So what's the height again? Uh, the height is uh, what block it's in. So like height 0 is the first block, you know, zeroth block. And we're now at height 500,000. Um, yeah, usually in, in diagrams it goes this way, but I, mean, I guess it could go up in <laughs> numbers. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so next you need to spend them. The spending is, it makes sense, right? You, it's not too crazy. Let's say you want to send six coins to someone. So what you do is you look through your set of UTXOs that are your UTXOs, and you try to find some such that the total, you know, the total number of coins is over six, and then you use them as inputs and then you add your outputs. So for example, I've got two UTXOs. These are you know, much smaller <coughs> numbers. But uh, this one has five coins in it, and this one has three coins. So I received at two different times. Once I got five coins for a fancy jacket, once I got three coins for a less fancy jacket, and now I want to buy something. And I want to send it to Bob, and I want to send him six coins. Um, well, I've got eight coins in my inputs, so I'll send him six, coin six coins. There's two coins left over. Uh, if I don't have this, it just goes to the miners. So I create my new output, which is my change output. Um, and then I send the remainder two coins here. Now, if it's actually these round, nice round numbers, uh, the fee would be zero, and it would probably not get confirmed on the Bitcoin network. You do have to have a small fee right now. Um, it's really small, though. It's like a couple cents now. Uh, it was pretty high a few months ago. Um, but but this, this will work. This is the basic idea. So, you look through your UTXOs, find some, OK, output 6, output 2. And then you know, once you've built this, sign it all, broadcast to the network. Make sense? Yeah. Is the change UTXO like your own? Yep, yep. You make, generally, what you'll do is you'll make a new private key, calculate the public key, hash it, make this address, and then add it in here all automatically. Um, you can, and some software does, just only use one key and one address. And so it'll be pretty clear because like, the keys for this signature will be the same as this key that it's sending to. And so then it's really clear. Even without doing that, it's usually pretty clear. And people can sort of guess, like, well, either, she, you know, either Alice is sending six coins back to herself and two coins to Bob, or she's sending six coins to Bob and two back to herself. right? Or maybe six coins to one person, two coins to someone else entirely. That's pretty unlikely. Um, usually, metrics will try to like analyze the transaction graph and say, like, oh, the smaller outputs are usually the payments, and the larger ones are the change. But, but you don't know right? So if the, if the addresses are all different. Yes? Uh, how does the fee get paid again? The fee is the difference between the inputs amounts and the output amounts. So in this case, the fee is 0 because I got 5, 3, you know, 8, and then 8 here. So really, what you do in real life is you'd make this like 1.999. Um, and then the fee would be that 0 0.001 or whatever that the miner gets in the Coinbase transaction. Um, that's another way to try to identify change outputs. 
if you actually had 5, 3, 6, and 1.999, I bet the 1.999 is going back to yourself, right? Nice even round numbers are, seem like real payments. Um, and then these, and if you've got one sort of bunch of nines at the end, oh, that was probably just reduced it a little to make the, the fee. Um, but these are all sort of guesses. If you're, a, if you're a third party observer looking at a transaction, you don't know, this could be two different people or this could be an exchange. And, you know, like it's hard to tell, but you can get some pretty good guesses. Yeah. In terms of fee, so if, you know, if you had no fee or if you had a really small fee and miners were requiring something higher, mm -hmm. that, just, that just sits on everyone's computer. Like they still share it with each other or just sit there until maybe there's a block? There are multiple thresholds. So there's the relay threshold which right now I believe in Bitcoin is one Satoshi per byte. So um, I think we said Satoshis are the smallest unit possible of Bitcoin. So one coin is actually 100 million Satoshis. Um, and there's no decimal places. That's just a UI thing. Um, so right now the, the minimum relay fee by default is one Satoshi per byte. So for a 250 byte transaction, you need 250 Satoshis, which is, I don't know, some fraction of a cent. Um, or maybe more than a cent now, I'm not sure. Um, and then the idea is if you see that a transaction below that, you won't even relay it to anyone else. You'll be like, this is so cheap that I'm not gonna bother sending it to everyone else, I'm just gonna ignore it. Um, but above that one Satoshi threshold, you will you know, accept it, verify the signatures, and then tr you know, pass it on to everyone else you're connected to. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean it will get into a block anytime soon. Uh, it's actually been really interesting the last I'd say six months, where the fees went up enormously. And you see sort of this like, you know, really crazy price inelasticity where people who were paying one cent then started paying 10 cents, a dollar, ten dollars, twenty dollars. And like, and like you, I guess the, and it was also sort of um, optimistic. It made me feel good. It's like, well, clearly they're, they were getting 20 bucks worth of utility out of this because they're now perfectly willing to pay 20 bucks and they were paying one cent a few weeks ago. That's kind of weird. And then it's now gone back down to like one cent. Um, but it's, it, there's, it's very inelastic in that, you know, there's a fixed size for how many transactions you can have per minute or per hour. Um, and when people really want to get in there, they have to just bid everyone else out. Um, so we'll talk about the fee mark. It's in a few weeks and replaced by fee. And that's sort of a new evolving thing. Um, but it's been really interesting to see in the last few months how it's changed. At, yeah. at, um, at ten thousand dollars per Bitcoin, a Satoshi is 0.01 cent. Tenth of a cent. Hundredth of a cent. A hundredth of a cent. So okay, so uh, the minimum really fee would be more like two and a half cents. So that's you know it's not zero. Um, that's still a fee, right? And you get enough of those, and you start making money. Um, but it's also interesting. Recently, it used to be that the the initial new coins coming out to miners was just overwhelmingly the majority of what they'd earn. Um, and people would sort of ignore fees uh, as, a, as a miner. But then in like December, January, I believe miners made more money in fees than in new coins being generated. Uh, I'm not sure if that averages out. Like there were definitely weeks where that was the case, or at least days. I'm not sure if it's average of the whole month. Uh, but it, but it, if you, um, total aside, sorry, but uh, this guy's site, is like a cool way to look at the uh, oh, the fees. Uh, so you can see like here's, he sort of organizes transactions by fee rate. It's too low res to really get everything. But it's, uh, if you just search for Joho, J-O-H-E-O, -E uh, he works on Bitcoin stuff and he made this cool site, which is open source and you could even run it on your own node if you wanted to and generate the same cool JavaScript colory things. Um, and you can see the, the fee market. And like from an, I'm, I'm not into, I'm not like an economist, but it is really interesting seeing like, there's, there's clearly um, market failures occurring here in that, um, so you can pay, the like green, you can pay 10 Satoshis per byte and you'll get confirmed in 10 minutes. Or you can pay 1,000 Satoshis per byte and you will also get confirmed in 10 minutes. And most people are paying 10, but someone's paying 1,000. Um, <laughs> you know, it's got the whole spectrum. You've got multiple orders of magnitude of people paying for the exact same thing. And, and they can all see that each other, it's, it's just a weird sort of seems broken. And, and part of it is just the cost to write the software. If you're like, 
you know, an exchange and you're like, everyone's sending you support requests and this happened. Okay, I don't know, just, just pay a 500 Satoshi per byte fee. And then it seems to work. And yeah, we're losing a couple thousand bucks a day, but let's just not deal with that. Um, and I think that's part of it, is that, you know, there's a lot of software out there that just has a fixed fee rate or even a fixed fee, regardless of how big the transaction is. Or, you know, it's, there's a lot of software that years ago wouldn't have to deal with this issue because there wasn't really competition to get into a block, and now they do. Um, so it's kind of cool look to look at and see the history of it and stuff. Um, but I'll get into, like, the into depth of fees and stuff uh, in, I think, two weeks or something. Uh, okay, any questions about... Last, yeah, yeah. What was that website again? Uh, well, it's in some Dutch or something. Just search J O J O H O E. Joho. He's the guy. Like, if you, it's the first thing on Google, right? Yeah. J O H O E is his, like, Dutch nickname or something. I don't know. He's a cool guy. He actually, um, I think I talked, did I talk? There was some randomness problems at some sites. He stole a bunch of Bitcoins and gave them back to their owners. Like, he found. <laughs> Some, there was like a K reuse, like nunce reuse uh, vulnerability in some wallets. And so he was like, hey, look, there's like 100 Bitcoins that I can just take because I can calculate the private key. And he took them and he was like, uh, I think I know who these are. And like, can you prove it? And then I'll give them back. Uh, you know, so he sort of grabbed, you know, finding a wallet with like thousands of dollars, you know, coming out of it on the street. And he sort of grabbed them all and like tried to get them back to people. So I don't know the guy. I've never met him, but seems like a nice guy. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> that's how Bitcoin works. There's like, you don't meet anyone, but you see these people. Oh, he's a nice guy. Oh, he's a jerk. Um, so I'm sure if, yeah, I, the weekend was kind of interesting over Twitter. But anyway. Um, I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you, you build these transactions. There are issues here. Two inputs, two outputs. That's going to be kind of big. You're going to have two different signatures. It's going to be a little bit higher fee. Um, what would work better than this? Kind of a silly question. What would work better than having two inputs and two outputs to make this transaction to pay someone six coins? <laughs> what? Yeah. Maybe if you wanted to have like an anonymous, anonymous transaction, you would send them like multiple transactions in smaller coins? Sure, yeah. That's, you could send, so that's actually two slides from now. Um, the next slide was just, well, what if you had a UTXO that was exactly the right size? Then it's easy. You just send them the six coin. If you have the exact right size UTXO in your wallet, great. You just send it over. It's, it's like if you go to a shop and they're like, OK, that's $10 for lunch. You're like, great. I have a $10 bill. Here it is. We don't have to deal with like pennies and quarters and stuff. It's annoying. Um, so sometimes this happens. It's great. Generally, it won't, right? Generally, you will have change and multiple inputs and outputs, and it's kind of annoying. So coin selection is a tricky problem for CSE you know, terms. It's NP hard, actually. Um, but there's heuristics that work OK. If you have a ton of UTXOs and you have to send these payments, you can't actually, in reasonable amount of time, calculate the optimal way to do it. But it, it, you know, there's, some, there's some heuristics that work OK. And the question is, what are we optimizing for? So generally, you want to optimize the, minimize the number of inputs used, right? So the, fewer in, the inputs are much bigger. They're going to be like 100-something bytes. And the outputs are pretty small. They're like 20, 30 bytes. Um, so the real, you know, if you want to minimize size of your transaction, minimize the number of inputs, which is easy, right? You just pick your biggest UTXO and spend that one. Yes? Isn't it like knapsack problem? Yeah, it basically is. Yeah. Uh, well, because it's multi-iteration. So if you're just trying to optimize your transaction right now, you just use your biggest UTXO. So for example, if you want, like, it's sort of in the analogy of you're at a checkout counter, and there's going to be, you, you, someone says, OK, that's you know, $12.93. If you want to minimize the number of bills you're handing to the cashier, you just take the 100 out of your wallet. right? That'll always work. And you, know, and you just say, I take the, my biggest bill, hand it to you. OK, I'm minimizing the amount of bills I'm handing you in this one transaction. However, that could result in a whole bunch of bills coming back, right? a bunch of weird change. And then also long term, that doesn't work. If your strategy is always just, just hand over the 100, or you know, go through your wallet, just hand over the biggest bill you have every time, no matter what they ask, that's super suboptimal. Because if they say 12.93, and you have a 20 and a 100, and you hand over the 100, like, why did you do that? You know? 
Um, <laughs> so, and then you're going to have like four 20s. Uh, so it's, it's very similar to that, except now the, it's similar to problems like that, except the change and bills have arbitrary denominations. There, are, there isn't a fixed, you know, you have hundreds, 20, hundreds, 50s, 20s, 10s, 5s. Now it can be any number. Um, so yeah, so if you're just looking at one time, just pick your biggest UTXO, you'll have the smallest transaction. But you want to minimize next time. So you ideally can eliminate the change output and just get, you know, perfect target. Um, it's, it's actually really complicated. There's really cool research on how do we select coins for like long term, uh, yeah. So why don't you just pick the biggest UTXO that's larger, or the smallest UTXO that's larger than your output size? Yep, that can work. That's not, opti like that's a good heuristic, right? That's a good like pretty easy to code, you know, sort your UTXOs, go here, use that one. Um, it, it's not super, it's not really optimal because then it's, it's a lot better than picking big eggs. Um, what do I have in my wallet? So I've, I've actually written an SPV wallet and like all this stuff just from scratch. And it's kind of interesting. You learn a lot about how it works. Um, I target two inputs instead of one. Because then eventually, if you do that, what will happen is you're, always, you're going to be using one input, which is great. And then you're going to run out of, you're going to have run out of big inputs. Um, and then you're going to always have to like use two or three. And you can get kind of a lot of dust. Dust, it's, dust is like the sort of colloquial term for really small UTXOs, where like you've got a bunch of pennies and stuff. Um, so that's one issue. Another issue is privacy concerns. So when you use two UTXOs, or have two inputs in the same transaction, that's linking those transactions, uh, linking those two uh, UTXOs. It's not definitive, right? You can interactively create transactions with other people. It, in practice, it doesn't happen, right? You could say, hey, I want to pay Alice five coins, and you want to pay Bob six coins, and let's put our, my two UTXOs and your two UTXOs, and we'll pay these two people, and we'll put our own change outputs, and we'll sort of mix this transaction together, and we'll all sign it. And you can do that securely, uh, that since you, know, you only sign when it all looks right to you, and everyone only signs when it's done. But the coordination problem is pretty severe, right? You have to find other people who want to pay, you know, make transactions at the same time that you do. It's annoying. So in practice, since you're just using your wallet, if you see a transaction with multiple inputs, you can, you can surmise, OK, those are the same person or the same company. And if you want privacy, um, if you want a maximum an anonymity, what kind of coin selection or payment strategy would you use? And yeah, if someone says, hey, pay me six coins, okay, well, I have these three inputs and I'm paying you two coins here and one coin here and three coins here. And I paid you six coins, but in three completely separate transactions. Um, that no one does either because <laughs> it's annoying. <laughs> uh, you could, it would, it would be the most anonymous. But even then, like, well, what if they all happen at the same time? And you see they all get in the same block and you're like, okay, well, they're not linked nearly as closely but I am seeing that these three transactions happen temporally similar at time. Um, so there's all sorts of things to try to optimize for. Um, OK, any other questions about, yeah? So does this mean that every time uh, people are going to have a smaller and smaller like, split of a paid coin in their wallets, like, they're just going to have smaller and smaller amounts? Because you're going to, like, if you have like, a $100 bill, and, and then you're paying $20, then you're going to get, you know, like, for other twenty dollar bills, yeah. eventually you're just going to have smaller, smaller. Is that is that a fair implication or? <laughs> okay, media, like short term, yes. Like if you start out with a bunch of coins, then start using it, yes. But it does reach equilibrium, right? In that, let's say you've got all these little tiny outputs of like you've got all these one dollar bills, um, but then you need to buy something that is twenty bucks. You have twenty inputs and one output. And whoever you're sending to now gets that one big output. Um, and so, so like, yeah, if it sort of init compared to if you graph that over time, yeah, initially everyone was getting, all their outputs were 50 coins each, right? Because that's how you mine them. And then now they're getting you know, smaller, but, but there is sort of an equilibrium um, once after you've used it for a while. Okay, any other questions about sort of coin selection, UTXO selection? Yes. For the anonymity part, I guess if you increase the number of transactions, you also have a limit with the, with the fees associated with all the transactions. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's, 
that's costly. I, that's another reason probably people don't do this. There's, I think the biggest reason is it's just annoying to code. And, it's like, and, and you can have failures where like, here, give me six coins. OK, I'll give you three, two, and one. Oh, the three didn't work, but the two and one did. Well, now what do we do? Like, you paid me half of it. Like, it's nice to have sort of all or nothing uh, payments. So, and also, you have to send different addresses. You know, there's all sorts of things. Also, it will be higher fees. Um, in practice, it's actually not much higher. Um, you don't gain, if you, if you did, let's say, having three one input, one output transactions versus one uh, three input, three output transaction, you don't save too much space. Um, most of the space is taken by the inputs. Um, and the overhead for a transaction is only 10 or 20 bytes or something. Uh, so it, it is not a huge difference. Um, the main difference is that you're never coalescing into larger output sizes. So you're going to always have to sign. And so you're going to have more inputs overall. Um, but yeah, this is a really, it's a kind of cool problem. There's like a lot of computer science-y stuff, but a lot of sort of heuristics and like how people use it. And also the fact that fees are variable over time means you might want different strategies when fees are low versus when fees are high. So right, when fees are low now, I should make, or, or maybe I just make a transaction to myself where I condense all my little $2 outputs into one big $1,000 output so that when later on, if fees are higher, I want to spend my money, I can do so more efficiently. Um, and, and there is evidence of this with like exchanges and stuff where a lot of times fees will be lower on the weekends because people aren't buying and spending Bitcoin as much, I guess. Um, and so certain companies would say, okay, over the weekends, we're going to sort of condense all our UTXOs um, and like combine them and then we can make smaller transactions during the week. Um, so there's all sorts of cool strategies here. So it's an interesting topic. I haven't like gone super in depth, but um, the guys at Chain Code work on it. I don't know. There's, there's like a lot of discussion about it, so it's kind of cool. Okay. Oh, I'm a little bit behind. Okay, next, uh, we'll talk about losing money. And that's another really important part of detecting the blockchain. It's, it's hard to do, but you, you have to detect when you've lost money. Uh, and it's tricky because just because you signed a transaction doesn't really mean your money's gone. You can't just unilaterally say, OK, well, I'm making this. I signed it. There, my, my money's gone from my wallet. Well, not necessarily. Um, maybe this never gets confirmed. Right? So maybe you still have that money. So you broadcast it, but you sort of have to wait until it gets into a block. And you also need to listen for your own UTXOs, even if you haven't made a transaction, and see if they've gotten spent. And why would that be? Like, can anyone think of reason why? I haven't signed anything, as far as my program is concerned, uh, but I might lose money anyway. Why would that be? Yeah. Well, one reason is if you get hacked. Sure, you get hacked. Um, that's the bad reason. A good reason is, well, maybe you have the same wallet on multiple computers, right? You've got the same keys and say, so this getting hacked is sort of a malicious version instance of this problem where, you know, I thought the wallet was only on my computer, but actually someone else has a copy. Um, but even, even non-maliciously, I've got a copy on my phone and I've got a copy on my computer. It's the same addresses, the same keys, the same UTXOs. That's totally doable. And then when I you know, spend money with my phone and get to my desktop, my desktop needs to sort of download and see, oh, money got, you know, you lost money. And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember spending that. Um, so you can have that you know, over multiple computers. So if you're designing wallet software, you do definitely need to make sure that even if it's sort of unexpected from the wallet itself and it doesn't seem like I generated a transaction, you can, there can still be a transaction taking your money away. Wallets without Bitcoin, and that's sort of a cheeky phrase. Okay, I don't mean they don't have any Bitcoins in their wallets. Um, I sort of mean they're not running Bitcoin in the same sense that we've talked of. So we talked about running Bitcoin, right? Where you download the software, you get the headers, you verify all the signatures, you build the UTXO set. Um, can you use Bitcoin without doing this? What do you guys think? What's a simple way to possibly use Bitcoin without having to do all these things? So like a really, really simple way. If you don't want to do work, what's the simplest way to not have to do work? Get someone else to do it, right? <laughs> uh, so for example, my dad has Bitcoin, but he just 
gives it, he's like, you, you deal with it. <laughs> so I've got a couple of Bitcoins that's my dad's and I have to make sure like, no, this is not my money. So yeah, get someone else to do it, right? Um, so that's sort of a, we're gonna talk about the different ways to get someone else to do this. And what we called before bit running Bitcoin, um, many now call a full node. And there's also the idea of like a light node or SPV node, which we'll talk about. Um, some people don't really like this distinction and it's like, well, wait, full node is running Bitcoin. These other things are sort of, you know, we shouldn't have to call it a full node. We should just call it this is a Bitcoin node and these other things are like not quite there. But uh, there's a lot, I, I will preface, there's a lot of um, argument about terms in this space. So there's some people who say SPV doesn't exist. Uh, and other people, this is an SPV. It's, so people argue about the words. Um, it's not like we have really nice definitive terms. I'm generally trying to use the most widely used terms, but there's probably people who will take issue with it, so sorry. So SPV is, is sort of a step down below running a full node in terms of security. It's called Simplified Payment Verification. It's uh, written up in the white paper on how to do it. And you can verify all the work uh, without doing too much you know, signature verification or having too much data. Uh, so the basic idea is you're, you're optimizing for not having to download as much and not having to store as much at the cost of some security. Um, and I'll talk about those, those costs. Okay, so before we had the sort of list of what you do uh, for a full node, the SPV method is a bit different, right? You still do the same part in the beginning, right? You connect, you get your headers, you verify all the work. Okay, cool. The next step, you tell another node that you're connected to all of your addresses, all the, all of the key public keys that you've ever generated, you tell it to them. Then you, uh, for each header you go through, and instead of downloading the whole block and getting all the transactions and verifying them, you ask the other node, hey, did I get any money or did I lose any money in this uh, block? Because I told you all my addresses. Oh, sorry. You also told them all your UTXOs. You also tell them, here's all, my, here's all the money I have. Here's all the addresses I could possibly receive money on. Um, did I get or lose any money in this block? And then they will return to you a Merkle proof of the transactions where they think, yeah, you got some money here, or yeah, you lost some money here, and you can verify those. Yes? What's the other node's incentive to even respond to you? Uh, there, there is none. Uh, you're not paying them. They don't know who you are. Uh, there's sort of a meta incentive in that, like, you know, I run a node that will provide these Merkle proofs um, because it's like, well, it helps Bitcoin, and maybe if I have some Bitcoin and I'm helping other people use it, my Bitcoin will be worth more. Uh, but that's a pretty, yeah, diffuse sort of thing. Um, and it can be a problematic because some of these things, I didn't mention that in these slides, but the server side can get a little bit costly in terms of CPU because you're potentially, as a server, you're, the client requests, hey, here's this block, can you sort of filter it for me? Find things that I'm looking for. So now you have to load that block into memory, look through it. Um, it's not too CPU intensive, but it can be, you know, when you have a bunch of them, like a 20 or 30 of them connecting to you, I've gotten, you know, 30%, 40% CPU for doing this kind of thing to serve other users. Um, just as a, like a most, almost all phone wallet, well, many phone wallets and many desktop wallets are using this model. Um, and so you'll see, let me go. Uh, so for example, if I, so here's a full node in the, this building. Uh, it, I actually rebooted it recently, so there's not very many connections incoming. Uh, but most, in practice, okay, these two are, are like actual full nodes, I bet. This is a fake node, this is a fake node, this is, they're all fake, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, sorry, these are all, f no, that one maybe not. Well, you can look, but like, a lot of nodes will say they're nodes and they're not, and they're just trying to track where transactions are coming from and like keep tra tabs on you and stuff. Um, and these are SPV nodes, these Bitcore, because they never, they don't really ask for, uh, I don't know what they're doing. They're not asking for anything. So you can look through all the messages. I think Ethan will talk about this a bit more uh, Wednesday. Um, but there are a lot of SPV nodes. There's a lot of stuff out in the network. You have no idea what it's doing. It's, it's, but it's pretty clearly not running a Bitcoin node. Um, so yeah, so I'll go through these steps a little bit. Um, and oh yeah, so the Merkle verification, 
uh, we talked about last week, I think, where if there's a block and there's thousands of transactions in it, uh, and this server wants to prove that one of these transactions is yours and is in there, say, okay, here's my transaction. They just need to provide you this transaction ID, this hash, and then you're able to see, okay, yeah, it was in the header, right? So my transaction is in there. You're not just making it up. I didn't talk about the good part. Well, the good part is you don't really need to maintain a UTXO set, and it's pretty small. So it saves space, saves time. What are the problems? There's a lot. And I definitely admit, I, before writing my own SPV wallet code, I didn't think there were a lot of problems with it. I thought it was like, oh, this is SPV. This is cool. This is how wallets work. Um, but when writing the code myself, I'm like, wait, this is horrible. <laughs> what do we do? Um, OK, so the first thing you do is you connect, you get the headers, and you verify them. This is exactly the same procedure as what a full node does. So there's no difference. It works, right? No difference there. The next step, you tell a node all of your addresses. What? <laughs> there goes all your privacy, right? <laughs> um, because you're just connecting to a computer. You have no idea who they are, who's running it. And you're telling them, hey, here's all of my addresses. And also, here's how much money I have, right? Here's all my UTXOs. <laughs> you can lie. You can add things that are not so. You can also add some addresses that aren't yours, or add some UTXOs that aren't yours. And you'll get some, some transactions back that you can then filter out on your own. right? So you can, you can raise the rate of false positives for that server. Um, and so there's these, these Bloom filters that are in uh, the Bitcoin co core code that they said, like, the idea was, well, you can sort of dial your own false positive rate. right? Um, I'm not going to go into how Bloom filters work. If you've used those in other classes, cool. Um, but it basically sort of gives some data, which allows people to match things. Um, but they don't, in practice, have good privacy. Um, you can create a Bloom filter where they've you know, got 10% false positive rate. And so when the server says, oh, it looks like their transaction, maybe it's not, because 10% of the time, it's just a false positive. However, when you have really high false positives, you lose all the efficiency savings of SPV. Um, and it sort of cascades, where you've got these false positives. And the server thinks, oh, you got money. Uh, but it's a false positive. And they add that you got money into the Bloom filter itself. And the Bloom filter can like really quickly become saturated, and they just start giving you everything. Um, so in practice, and there's some papers about how the people who put the Bloom filters into Bitcoin like thought, oh, this is good for privacy. It's fine. And in practice, it really is not good for privacy. So you end, it, it, you end up basically telling a node all your addresses. Um, and there's, there's research on how to do this in a better way. Um, and it's one of those kind of things where some random anonymous person with a, I think, like inappropriate swear word email address uh, posted to the mailing list and say, hey, why don't you guys do it this way? And it was like, oh, yeah, we sh should have done it that way. Oops. Um, the basic idea is instead of creating a Bloom filter as a client, sending it to a server, basically, instead of telling the node all your addresses and asking, um, what the nodes will do, the full nodes, will create a Bloom filter based on the entire block. And then the client can retrieve that, match that against their addresses, and see, hey, did this block have anything of interest to me? And if so, request it. Um, much better privacy um, at a pretty small cost in overhead. And so just no one thought of it. There's a lot of things in Bitcoin where like, no one thought of it. And we did something dumb. And then something better came out. And now we're working on that. OK, so the tell, all, the tell the node all your addresses, that's a problem. For each header, ask if you gained or lost UTXOs. So can you think of any problems here? Not Yeah, yeah. Could they lie? Yeah. Some of them? Yep. Easy to lie. You just don't tell them. You know, if you're a server, you just omit things. And you can maybe mitigate that by connecting to a bunch of different nodes, but then you lose even more privacy because you've now shared all your addresses and money with multiple anonymous nodes. Um, but yeah, it's really easy to lie by omission. You know, someone says, hey, here's all my, my addresses. OK, did I get any money? Yep, yep. And then you see one where they got a bunch of money, and you just don't tell them. And they don't know. Um, this can be annoying in regular wallets in the Lightning Network stuff that I work on that I'll talk about hopefully later. Uh, this can actually be very damaging. You can lose money because of this. Uh, but in general, in Bitcoin, you won't lose money because you're not aware of a transaction. 
So this is, this is also a problem, right? Easy to live on a mission. The Merkle proofs help, but they prove inclusion, not exclusion. There's no way to construct a proof that, you know, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you a proof that I'm not omitting anything. Although with the idea of the block-based filters sending, there's, there are ways to construct that. Uh, so it's even better in that sense. Okay, so these are some of the disadvantages of SPV. Um, can anyone think of any other problems with it or? Yeah. The estimation. Yeah, okay, so yeah, you don't know, since you're not downloading the blocks, uh, you don't really know how much fees other people are paying. You're not verifying, so even when you get transactions, you cannot verify any signatures because you don't have a UTXO set. So you just see that it came from somewhere, but you don't know if the thing it's spending even exists or has a key or anything, so you can't verify the signature. Uh, you don't know how much money was coming in, so even if you look at the transactions, you can't tell what fees they're paying. Um, you sort of can if you download an entire block. There's, there's ways around it, but it's like really ugly. Um, so it's, it can be very difficult to estimate fees. So in practice, you probably ask the same server that you've told all your addresses and all your UT UTXOs to, hey, what fee should I use? And they tell you that. And the idea is, well, if I ask five people, hopefully most of them will be around the same. Um, so there's a bunch of problems with SPV. Okay, so SPV sounds pretty bad, right? And I think I'll stick my full note. But uh, is there anything worse than SPV asking for a frack? Can I, can I, can I go worse? So does anyone know something we can do that's, that's worse security, worse privacy than SPV? That's also very popular. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's, that's even worse. But yeah, uh, there's, there's a step in between. Um, so you can take out some of these steps where you just, you just have an API and you just ask people. You have a website, you know, blockchain.info or Mycelium wallet or a bunch of wallets, uh, BitPay's, uh, Copay, things like that, where you don't verify any headers, you don't look at any Merkle proofs. You just skip right to the tell the remote node all your addresses and UTXOs and ask how much money you've gained or lost, right? So you sort of outsource the entire process. You don't store really anything on your computer. And you say, well, I've got, but you do have your private keys, right? You say, I made some private keys, I made some addresses, and then I tell this website, hey, here's all my addresses. How much money do I have? Um, and the server responds, yeah, you've got UTXOs, cool. So then you can build the transactions, sign them, and send them to the server. So what are some advantages and disadvantages of this? Like, there's probably some obvious disadvantages, right? Can anyone think of an attack that this does not help you against? Yeah. You could just make up transactions. And yep. send them to the server can just say, hey, you got 1,000 Bitcoins. You're like, awesome. But it's just completely made up. Um, right? you, you, you don't verify, as the client, you don't verify anything about these transactions. Um, so that's a pretty big uh, problem. And, and the thing is, in practice, like. One of the issues is that people are generally not as aware of these types of attacks because mostly people worry about spending their money and they don't really, you know, merchants worry about chargebacks and worry about receiving and verifying that they've received funds all the time. But most people's experience is, you know, they get paid once a month or twice a month with a paycheck and the money shows up in their bank or whatever and they never really worry about that and they worry about spending their money and getting defrauded or things like that. Um, so it's not something a lot of people think about all the time is, did I actually get paid? Um, so there, you know, there's easy fraud that you can do with this kind of attack vector where you, know, you sell a car on, on Craigslist and someone comes and says, yeah, I paid you the Bitcoins, but they've actually compromised the server and, and you haven't gotten paid at all, but you think you have, you give over the goods. Um, so yeah, potential problems. They can say you got paid when you didn't. They can say you lost money when you didn't. Um, and if it's in a browser, that's even more fun because they can change the code without, you know, the, the JavaScript is not pinned to anything. So if someone compromises that server, they can change the code and potentially get your private keys. Um, so, so you have really very little security. Um, the, the blockchain is not really providing anything in this case. However, this is one of them. This is much more popular than running a full or SPV node. 
um, because you know blockchain and info, you just sign in. Uh, there's a lot of wallets on the phones that work this way as well. Um, and you do at least have your private keys, right? Hopefully. Um, so you've got that, right? You, you're, you're not giving custody in any sense to them, but they, they learn a lot of information. Okay, so not even SPV. Can we do worse? And wait, you, someone, yeah. Coinbase, well, so the Coinbase company was an example of, can we do worse? Yes, you can. Someone else's coins is worse. Uh, the case where my dad, you know, said, hey, can you hold on to these coins for me? It's worse, right? He doesn't run a node. He doesn't have his private keys. He doesn't really understand Bitcoin that well. Um, he wants to, but he's busy. And he's like, hey, you know this stuff. You deal with it. I, you know way more about this than I do. I trust you since, you know, we're dad and son and stuff. So, like, not a huge trust problem there. Uh, so I do it for him. Um, but, you know, banks, right? You don't even have... So the idea of a, a site or an exchange or things, something like this where you don't even have your private keys. You just have a website where they run a node or, and a wallet, and they owe you the money. Um, why is there a slash there? Okay. Um, it tends to end badly, and it, you know, even if it doesn't end badly, it, it misses the point, right? The whole idea of Bitcoin was like, hey, you can sort of have your own money. It's kind of cool. It's running on your computer. Um, it feels like it's missing the point to just hand it over to some bank. Um, and it's not even a bank, right? Most of these sites, a big reason why it tends to end badly is there aren't the same protections that banks, you know, the banks have to do a lot of work and there's FDIC and there's all sorts of rules and, and they also build these big structures with really heavy stone pillars so that you're like, yeah, they can't run off because this <laughs> bank's not going to move. It's made out of rocks. Um, and the banks in Bitcoin do not have big stone pillars. IP addresses are really easy to change and just move the computers around. Um, another thing, they're running a node, right? These, these Bitcoin banks that hold all your funds. Sometimes they don't. So these banks themselves might run SPV nodes or API things. I don't want to like name any names, but like there's pretty good evidence that like, you know, big exchanges might even just connect to uh, an API and not even run their own node. Um, another, there's a lot of things like this where when something bad doesn't happen, people just keep pushing it. Um, where miners themselves don't verify the blocks because they think, well, he must have created a, a valid block and I'm not going to verify it and, and everything works. So the other thing is, while, while it sounds really bad, in practice, there haven't be, been really many SPV attacks um, or API attacks, right? We, we know of this, but in practice, it's, it's hard to do, right? You're, if you want to defraud someone with, say, um, the, you know, by compromising blockchain on info, you have to compromise blockchain on info. You don't have to do all the proof of work um, because they're not validating it, but it's still hard to do. And, you know, it requires a coordinated active attacker with quite a bit of resources. Um, and so when it doesn't happen, people say, well, SPV is just as good, right? We don't have any evidence of people being defrauded, so it's just as good. Um, but that is kind of dangerous because when everyone starts doing it, you start to lose these protections. Any questions about the someone else's coins model? There's all sorts of legal issues. There's um, a very long list of ways it ends badly. Um, I don't know, what, what is the half-life of a custodial exchange in Bitcoin? It's like a year or two, and they, they drop off. <laughs> um, OK, so why do people do this? And here's sort of a table of trade-offs with these things. It's mainly convenience. And so that's, you know, it's a real reason to do it. So if you're running a full node, uh, you're going to have to download at least 170 gigabytes. That's a lot, right? It's going to take a while. Storage, you're going to have to store at least four gigabytes, like long term. And it, that, that's going up, but not going up too much. It's actually gone down in the last few weeks. Um, that's sort of the UTXO set, right, that you have to keep track of. You don't have to keep track of this 170 gigabytes. It by default does, but you can turn on pruning. But that's also super user unfriendly. You have to edit a bitcoin.conf file and type pruning equals 500 or something and then save it. And then it'll prune down to four gigs. There's no, uh, at least that I'm aware of, there's no GUI nice menu thing where you can say, hey, I want to enable pruning. I don't want to have to store this. Um, speed, on a really nice computer, it will take at least six hours to download all this and verify it. 
Um, it's pretty impressive because it used to be more, but that's still six hours. People don't want to deal with that. Privacy. Okay. Certainly we can do better. There's a lot of research on how to make privacy in Bitcoin better, but this is what we got. You know, it's okay. Security. Okay. Um, we, you know, this is as good as we've got. Okay. So then you go down to SPV. Network. You only have to download about 50 megs, all those headers. Um, if you've got a wallet with lots of transactions, you're going to download 100, 200, 300 megs because you're going to have to download all the transactions that you, you know, that pay you or you're paying out to. Speed. I said seconds. I think I want to change it to minutes. I don't know. It's not, it's not that fast. It's, it's a lot faster. I think seconds is an exaggeration. Well, it's like 60 seconds. I don't know. Anyway, it's pretty fast, right? You download all the headers. That takes the same amount of time, but that can be a minute or two. And then you're syncing the blocks. It's really quick. They're small. Privacy is poor, right? You, you lose a lot of your privacy in SPV because you're basically telling random computers on the internet, hey, here's all my money. Uh, and hey, here's all my addresses. There's, it's not, you're not completely losing everything, but, but it's pretty easy for um, actors to reconstruct your wallet from that. Uh, security, medium. I don't know. It's, there haven't been any real attacks on this. Um, but you're not verifying the rules of Bitcoin, right? If everyone's running SPV, then a miner can say, hey, I just generated a thousand coins out of nowhere. And no one's looking for that transaction. It only pays me. Um, and no one's going to see that and reject the block, right? So, so if everyone runs SPV, you're sort of not checking up on the miners, uh, which is a very real threat. Like miners do crazy stuff and you got to watch out for them. Um, yeah, so security, eh, questionable. Uh, API query, where you just ask a website, hey, here's all my addresses. How much money do I have? Um, network traffic, I don't know, less than a megabyte. You have to load the websites and stuff, but it's pretty light. Storage, you basically don't have to store anything. I mean, you have to store your private keys, um, but those can be sort of password-based and derived on the fly. Uh, speed, like a second, right? It's real quick. You're, you're, you're making an HTTP query, you're getting a response, you're parsing it. It's real quick. Privacy is poor. It's worse than SPV, but because it's like now it's really easy because they just, you just hand them over, over all your addresses in the clear. Um, and security is also quite poor, right? In that they can say, hey, you got money or you lost money and you just accept what they say. Um, hold my key. This is network traffic. I don't know. You have to go to a website, I guess. There's no storage, there's no speed, there's no privacy, there's no security. You're just handing the entire thing off to someone else. Um, so what, <laughs> what would you guys guess are the most, like, popularity of the different models? <laughs> most popular, least popular. Yeah, this is definitely the most popular, second most, third most, fourth most. Yeah, so it, everyone does this. A bunch of people do this, some people do this, and... A couple thousand people do this. Um, it's a problem. And this is something like, that is one of the ongoing problems, not just in Bitcoin. Uh, Ethereum. <sighs> Ethereum would be a little different, but still, it's going to be a lot of this. Um, Ethereum has sort of weird, different SPV. There's, there's like other S models. There's sort of one in the middle for Ethereum that's also quite popular, uh, where it's like SPV with UTXO commitments. Um, well, no, I guess it would be more here. Anyway, I'm not going to go into Ethereum. But yeah, so it's, it's a problem. And like, there's different ways to attack it. Like, one of the issues is that a lot of people who program Bitcoin itself really only focus on this. And they say, look, we're not, this is not our problem, right? Like, we don't, we can't solve this. We're going to try to make this, the way we're going to try to solve this is to, let's try to get the speed down, right? If it takes days, people are going to move this way. If it takes hours, maybe a lot of people say, hey, I was using SPV, but yeah, it's not too bad running this. I'm going to run this and get the more security. Uh, let's try to keep this number down. Let's try to keep you know, speed down. Let's try to improve privacy and security of the full node. That is generally um, what most of the Bitcoin core developers focus on, uh, which you know, I don't argue with. But it, it does lead to some neglect of like the SPV, uh, where there's not, you know, the, it's been over a year, year and a half, almost two years, where we know how to make SPV better and more secure, but there's not a lot of uh, enthusiasm and w people working on it. Um, and people argue about the security of these things. Uh, this, 
there's not much you can do. I mean, there, there is kind of cryptography research. Like, hey, how can I, you know, is there some cool way I can send you all my addresses so that you can figure out how much money I have without you learning all my addresses? Some kind of, uh, that's called private information retrieval. And there's all sorts of papers on that. Um, in practice, there aren't any that use that. Um, and this, well, yeah, multi-sig, like have, that's more like regulation, right? Can we have sort of restrictions and rules on these essentially banks to try to make it safer? Maybe. Um, but yeah, this is, these are sort of the two where, you know, software development can definitely help, you know, make this a lot easier to use. Um, and so, you know, we can encourage people to use it, but most people, since security is hard because most people, if you don't see a problem, this is a lot easier. And a lot of people think, well, I'm not good at computers, so they are, and it's safer if I give all my money to someone else. Um, in, in some cases, it could be true. Um, but that has sort of systemic effects, where now you've got these, you know, there's like five computers in the world, and if you're able to compromise those, like, they have just billions of dollars worth of Bitcoins on them. Um, and so that's why, you know, for, for black hat attacker, hacker kind of people, it's like the best thing to do. It's like so, it's like there's a computer somewhere and it's got a billion dollars of like untraceable money that I can just steal. Like it's, <laughs> what could be, like, yeah, I could get everyone's passwords. That's cool. Or like, yeah, I could like read people's emails, whatever. Or I can just steal a billion dollars. Like, <laughs> so what do you think they're going to do? Uh, <laughs> So yeah, so this leads to you know huge concentrations of coins uh, on in a very small number of nodes, and people try to attack it. So this is sort of the landscape we're in now. It's certainly not ideal. Uh, there's a lot of technology that's pretty good that's not being used. There's a lot of technology that's crummy that's being used a lot. And uh, you know how to make this stronger and faster, how to make this faster, things like that are really interesting research areas I'm working on. Okay, and yeah. Uh, almost done. Wallets are fun. Big usability issues. Uh, try, if you want to try testnet wallets, you can try downloading them, playing around with them. Um, they often leave quite a bit to be desired. Uh, the one I work on, Lit, leaves enormous amounts to be desired. <laughs> uh, there's, it's all in text. Um, and Ethan should be here Wednesday, and good luck with the problem set.